for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Kristen Covey and I'm an educator with the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. And I am going to be the facilitator today and also the, the tech support as needed. Um, our main presenter is going to be Joe Crumbly, and he's the Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator for the Snohomish Conservation District. So he will be delivering um, the talk today, but we also have Monica Vanderveer in here again. Um, she's been here for the last two classes, and she's a communication specialist for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. Um, but has a lot of experience um, in gardening and sustainable yard care in her, her free time outside of work. So um, she has a wealth of knowledge and she will be answering questions in the chat box. Um, so I will um, get back to more of the logistics of how this class will go in a minute, but I just wanna thank both Monica and Joe um, for their time today and for being here to teach us a little bit about sustainable food gardening. Um, so, um, I will um, give you a little bit of background on these classes. I've done this before for the other two. So if you've already heard this spiel before, feel free to, to tune out or, you know, this would be a great time to go refresh your coffee. Um, but for those of you that are new, I just, I want to provide a little context. So um, the Snohomish Conservation District and the King County Wastewater Treatment Division have partnered on this series of classes for six years now. Um, and the main reason we initially formed the partnership is because of a place called Brightwater. And Brightwater is King County's newest wastewater treatment plant um, that we uh, constructed in 2011. And um, it's actually located just across the, the county line in Snohomish County. Um, so, uh, we treat water for both King County and Snohomish County residents that live near the treatment plant. Um, and another large component of that project was to build a really fancy community center called Brightwater Center um, that's open to the public. So um, it made perfect sense for us to partner with the Snohomish Conservation District because we, we both share an interest in um, improving water quality. We share community members, and then now we also have a space for everyone to gather together. So normally um, we would be at this location um, for these classes. And um, I just also wanted to mention that we have two more classes after this, if you're looking at this box here. So the next classes we have are Landscaping for Wildlife on February 20th. And um, the last class is all about um, managing pests and nuisances in your yard and garden. And I'm really excited about those two because we actually haven't done those classes yet. So this will be our first time and I'm just looking forward to that. So hopefully, hopefully you can join us for those. All right, and Joe will be talking a little bit more about the Snohomish Conservation District, but I just wanted to share briefly a little bit about the work that we do. So um, if you can see this map, this is the entire service area for the King County Wastewater Treatment Division. We have three large regional treatment plants, including Brightwater, that serve about 1.8 million people. So we're cleaning wastewater 24 seven for 1.8 million people. Um, and obviously that's the, the main focus of our work is to clean wastewater, but we also want to provide educational opportunities and support to the communities we serve. So we have a lot of education programs for students of all ages and adults as well. Um, and one of them is this, this series. So um, this is what we would look like if we were in person. This is a picture, I think, from last year. And I, I like this photo, and I just like to mention that um, there's a lot going on on our, our property. And one of my favorite things is um, the dahlias that we have. So this is the, the back angle of our building. And um, this gentleman is a neighbor who is retired, but um, found a passion for growing dahlias in his retirement and offered to grow them at our site years ago and has done it every year since then. He brings new flowers every year and they're beautiful from you know June to October so if you're in the area that's a great time to come visit. Okay so um, moving on to the logistics of the class so Joe will be talking for probably about an hour or so um, which will leave us about 20 to 30 minutes at the end for um, more questions so um, 
just know we have that. And then during his, his talk, feel free to ask questions in the chat box. So that's Monica's job. It's, it's a big one, but she's going to do her best to answer those questions as they come up. If um, she can't answer them or, you know, she'd prefer <clears throat> Joe to answer them at the end, we will ask extra questions at the end that we don't address in the chat box. So just know that your question will get answered. All right, so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen so Joe can take over. Great, well, thank you everyone um, for joining us. And uh, I'm excited to get into the swing of things here. Again, my name is Joe Crumbly. I'm the Urban Agriculture Program Coordinator for the Snohomish Conservation District. I have a, a Master's of Science in Food Systems, and I'm really passionate about um, this field of work. My job in general kind of balances um, natural resource conservation and uh, food security efforts. So I'm excited to talk to you today about sustainable food gardening. Um, so today's talk, we'll go over the sustainable gardening benefits, uh, practical information to get started and managing crops as well as uh, donating food harvests. So the conservation districts um, were born out of the result of a crisis, which was uh, the Great Depression, but more importantly, the dust storms um, going across farm country in the Midwest. And so we were in a state of crisis then as we were today, or as we are today for uh, different reasons. So due to drought and poor management of topsoil, um, the conservation districts were helped uh, or were created to help uh, farmers address soil conservation and food uh, scarcity during the Dust Bowl. We're still uh, helping today and uh, we've adapted a little bit to alter what we do. So now we do a little more than just um, soil conservation, but also deal with uh, water conservation, water quality issues, and general natural resource conservation. Uh, so we help people protect our waterways and we continue uh, to work to ensure uh, food security efforts in our community. So our Lawns to Lettuce program, which is one of uh, our urban agriculture programs, um, gives a better return on investment and a return on environment. Uh, lawns eat up resources, money, and time. Uh, getting much back. And so somewhere between 30 to 50% of the daily water use in a household uh, will go to lawns, uh, which doesn't give much back to your family when you think about that in comparison with a, a homegrown vegetable garden. So landowners converting uh, their lawn to lettuce improves local food security efforts and natural resource conservation. Uh, people save money and enjoy healthier yards. You will know more about um, addressing climate change when you implement some of these practices that we're gonna go over today. So one of the more important things that we uh, like to vocalize is Healthy soil, it's really the core of sustainable gardens. We wanna build soil, not just uh, lose it like we did during the Dust Bowl years. And this will be uh, covered in a little more detail in our other um, PowerPoint that we'll give access to uh, today's attendees covering composting and soil health. And But we will dive a little bit into that today. So growing food locally um, reduces the transportation cost and fuel needed to get, uh, get the food where it needs to go. So there's a lot of benefits and that's definitely one of them. Sustainable gardens uh, provide healthy food. Um, growing food in your garden helps you make sure that you um, don't have additives in your food that you don't know about. So locally sourced food and locally produced food will not need preservatives to keep it looking fresh, uh, which definitely contributes a lot to consumer health. Uh, there's something around 20 or around 70% of all um, food in grocery stores in the US has some sort of preservative in it. So of course, as we mentioned, uh, natural resource conservation and, and uh, of course habitat is very important to the conservation district. And so sustainable gardens are a great source of food and you can make sure your garden is safe for people, pets, and wildlife. 
using natural yard care practices means your food will be pesticide free. Uh, supporting local agriculture and preserving farmland is crucial um, due in part to Snohomish County being the fastest growing county in Washington today. When uh, housing can encroach on farmland, it's really important to try and find a balance and connect people with where their food comes from. Gardens, of course, can help with food security efforts. Uh, when your home and community gardens can help your food dollars go further in times like these, uh, it's really important that the food supply can be um, more self-sufficient when uh, the food supply is going to be affected by disruptions to supply chains. Um, it's really good to be able to feed yourself, your family, and your community. And that's of course not just on a local level, but worldwide when we're dealing with this, um, this pandemic to this day. So now that you know the benefits, uh, we're gonna go over a couple uh, steps to help you get started. Of course, uh, adequate sunlight is a very important step uh, to consider. And ideally when you're establishing a home a vegetable garden, you're gonna to wanna to have at least eight to 10 hours of direct sunlight each day, which is required for most vegetable varieties. Uh, although leafy greens and root vegetables don't require quite as much sun as other varieties, you wanna make sure that you're giving yourself as many options as possible uh, in order to have a more diverse uh, variety available of vegetables that you can grow. Um, I know we have a lot of folks from all over uh, the country and even the world in this um, class today. I will say that in uh, Washington state and the Pacific Northwest in general, we, we did luck out in having a, a quite a long growing season in general. Um, we don't have quite the, the temperature increase and drop throughout the year that we find in other parts of the country. So of course, you're gonna to wanna to know where all of your utilities are um, before you start a garden project. Um, in a lot of the garden installations that we uh, implement throughout the county, um, there's not gonna be a whole lot of digging, um, but even so, you're not gonna to wanna to put raised garden beds or um, uh, fruit trees and things of that nature on top of like a septic tank or on top of a drain. And a lot of my coworkers involved in uh, community conservation efforts that um, pertain more to like rain gardens and things of that nature do require a lot of digging. So in general, we do utilize this number a lot and, and this number can change uh, if you're going into other areas uh, of the country or other states. Um, but in the Pacific Northwest, this is the number you're gonna wanna call uh, before you start to dig for a garden project. As you can see here, this is a prime example where we went to a site visit for an individual homeowner in Snohomish County, and they were looking to uh, implement raised garden beds and uh, sheet mulching, which is something that we'll get into in just a moment. And so although we're not going to be uh, digging necessarily, um, you want to make sure that you're not covering up any um, drains or things like that. Uh, there, of course, can be all kinds of utilities found underground, um, you know, cable, electric sewer, uh, gas lines, everything like that. So it's really important, um, speaking from personal experience, that you want to make sure and, um, and play it safe and know where all of these utilities are located in your yard. So now we're going to go into um, various different types of uh, garden beds. And this is a before picture of um, prior to the garden installation occurring. And uh, throughout this PowerPoint, a little bit later on, we're gonna recirculate back into this picture and I'll show you an after picture, um, emphasizing some different garden bed installations that were uh, placed at this project site. So digging up sod and amending soil um, can be a great option for you. Um, it's one effective option, but it is quite labor intensive. Um, we do have engineers and different folks that work for the conservation district that really 
um, have the knowledge and expertise to tell folks during a site visit the, the specifics um, about how far away you may want to be from your house and your foundation before implementing any of these kinds of projects. Um, but in general, it's a good rule of thumb to be at least 10 feet away from your house. Um, this again requires good well-drained soil. Um, if you're willing to uh, make certain soil amendments in the soil, that uh, helps as well, but that's definitely a prerequisite. So here's a great before and after picture, as you can see. Um, you kind of marked out the lawn area that they were looking to implement some of these changes we're going to go over. Uh, here you can kind of look in more detail and see that there's a, a pollinator garden aspect to it. Um, there's fruit trees involved in there. I see a chicken coop, a little herb garden, um, sheet mulching here and there. Uh, I even see, uh, looks like some lattices for uh, maybe some climbing sweet peas. And so we'll go into more detail in this uh, presentation and some of the following in the next couple of weeks and months about um, how these different uh, sustainable practices can help uh, the garden space have uh, develop a symbiotic relationship where they can um, work together to make the garden space thrive and increase production. Removing lawn and uh, sod is, a, is an option like I covered, but so is no-till gardening. Um, it's less labor intensive. It also in, uh, contributes to soil health and it uh, increases beneficial insects and microbes. So um, some of the uh, beneficial insect um, aspect of this presentation will be dived into a little more deeply in our upcoming presentation on March 6th. Uh, however, just to keep it short today, um, one of the reasons why no-till gardening is beneficial for those uh, beneficial insects and microbes is because the less that you're going to um, disturb the soil, uh, the healthier those beneficial insects and microbes will be, um, which can increase your production. Um, of course, those beneficial insects and microbes also help expedite the decomposition process as well. Here's a picture of um, when you're utilizing uh, mulch and how it's, uh, it's a good example of what not to do. So here we have a picture of the root ground being suffocated by what we refer to as volcano mulching. Um, this is something that we tell homeowners to avoid um, and to really focus on not covering up the root system um, more than necessary. And so when you mulch around the base of a tree, you want to make sure it, and it's not going above the, the base of that root system. Another option is uh, sheet mulching. This is a great way to utilize um, some excess uh, cardboard that may be laying around your house. Um, there's all kinds of uh, different things you can include in sheet mulching, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, but oftentimes if folks just have a little bit of cardboard and they have uh, wood chip mulch, that's a good way to go about keeping weeds at bay. So it really reduces weeds drastically because you can imagine they're blocking the sunlight from reaching the weeds and the grass underneath that cardboard and, and mulch layer. Um, and they also increase nutrient content and water retention. And so uh, over time, the cardboard will break down. It usually takes a couple months to break down. Um, but by that time, uh, most likely those, um, the weeds have, uh, have died off uh, for the most part because of a lack of sunlight. The cardboard does add a little bit of nutrients to the soil. And uh, by the time the cardboard is um, reduced, the, um, the mulch is uh, there to keep any remaining weeds at bay. Uh, as this previous slide mentions, it's also good for the lazy gardener, which is an important aspect because a lot of what we do is trying to implement uh, garden spaces for folks that may not have a lot of excess time and they wanna reduce their labor. Um, and she mulching is a great way to do that. So. Um, whether it's just sheet mulching around specific plant varieties or 
sheet mulching around, let's say raised garden beds, which we'll get into in a moment, it's a great way to keep the weeds at bay and reduce weeds from germinating in your garden area. It also gets rid of grass, reduces erosion, and stormwater runoff into nearby waterways. Um, one of the aspects that you wanna keep in mind is it is highly acidic. And so you only wanna apply around uh, the base of certain plants. Um, a good example of, of uh, what to apply it around in the Pacific Northwest can be blueberries, um, but there are other options that you can consider. And if you wanted to kind of mitigate some of the acidity, uh, a good organic soil amendment to include for that uh, can be lime, um, which kind of neutralizes that acidic component. Um, so as I mentioned, the sheet mulching really can be quite simple and just stick with cardboard and uh, wood chip mulch. However, this diagram here kind of breaks down if you wanna get um, specific with it. There's a lot of great layers that you can include in there. Um, and I would say that some of the weeds that you wanna keep at bay would require a, a deeper layer of um, sheet mulching. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, some of those varieties include uh, morning glory, um, blackberry, and uh, ivy. And so that of course depends on what part of the country you're from and what part of the US uh, you're tuning in to this class from. Um, but in general, uh, those are some Pacific Northwest um, nuisances that we utilize sheet mulching quite a bit to try and uh, mitigate. Here's a great resource um, for looking into the approximate square footage uh, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, amount of yards that you would want uh, of wood chip mulch. And so one of the things that this website will ask you is, um, the square footage that you're dealing with, as well as the soil depth. And from there, it will calculate the amount of yards or uh, total cubic yards needed to cover that amount of space. Um, again, for some of those nuisances uh, that, we, that I mentioned, like um, blackberry or morning glory or ivy, um, it's really best to do you know, one to two feet of wood chip mulch. But if you're not really dealing with those, you don't have to go quite as deep um, as shown in the previous uh, slide with that diagram breakdown. Um, checking if there has any contaminants is also a very important thing when you're considering site selection and how to adapt your project site to meet your needs. Um, the USDA Dirt Alert Program is a really great resource for finding or I'm sorry, the Department of Ecology Dirt Alert website is a really great resource for finding where soil contaminants might be in your area or in your state. And so you can see in this, um, this map, it talks about some of the causes of um, soil contamination. I, I see in South Snohomish County in South Everett, there's a previous smelting plant um, and so there's uh, unfortunately high levels of lead and arsenic in certain areas uh, in Everett that we, we help um, implement, you know, raised garden beds and things to, um, to avoid uh, dealing with that contaminated soil. In um, part of Pierce County, it looks like there was a, a Tacoma smelter there as well as in uh, Stevens County, there was a smelter. And then in the orchard lands, you can um, see that there's also some soil issues. So a lot of those um, orchards are previously uh, in orchards in the past in Washington state, there was arsenic used um, when they were growing apples. And I think that practice has changed a little bit over time, um, but unfortunately a lot of the soil contaminants linger in the soil longer than you would expect. And so if there's ever any concern, it never hurts to reach out to the, apartment, the Department of Ecology or check out their website. And it's always good to just play it safe and uh, look into these um, details further, which of course leads me to uh, this next section about raised garden beds and how to mitigate those contaminants from reaching um, edible plants, you know, produce and, and fruit trees that you're looking to consume. Um, so they're great for uh, poor quality soil that may not have the amount of nutrients that you need to start growing effectively and successfully or with contaminated soil. Um, these garden beds shown here 
actually have a wood bottom to them. And I'll get into more detail about where these come from and how we um, distribute these throughout the county. But these are a great way to uh, make a great barrier between any contamination and the, um, the food that you're gonna grow and eventually consume for yourself and others. So not only is it a great barrier between either poor soil or contaminated soil, but they also look quite aesthetically pleasing. And there's all kinds of different varieties you can choose from. Um, these ones are specifically from shipping containers. And this was a community garden space we set up um, in Sultan, Washington. So it was a great little cul-de-sac where it had a boys and girls club. It had a, um, a food bank in there. It has a senior center. And so a lot of what they grow actually went towards the food bank and then the senior center and the boys and girls club club had a, a salad bar that of course was going on prior to the, the COVID-19 situation we're dealing with. But um, nevertheless, it will res resume again one day. And um, yeah, it's a great way to bring together the community in the way that these um, various organizations in this cul-de-sac had gathered around this community garden space and all um, kind of added their volunteer hours and utilized the produce grown to connect with one another, um, young and old alike. Um, so building your raised garden beds, we're definitely going to um, provide more additional uh, documents with more details about how to build your own um, and various options you can choose from. Uh, but one thing to consider uh, along with the amount of sunlight that you have access to this bed is just how heavy they're going to be um, once you fill them up with soil and compost and various soil amendments. Um, to go back to this slide very briefly, these garden beds are at least 70 to 80 pounds, um, even more if they get wet. And so that's quite heavy already. You can imagine when they're filled up with compost and, and uh, soil that they're going to be even heavier and almost impossible to move around. So you're really gonna to wanna to focus on an area that has at least eight hours um, of sunlight, which is required for most vegetables. Um, again, if you don't have that much sun, uh, there are a couple options uh, like some leafy greens and root vegetables and other things that you can grow. Um, but it's ideal to have a, um, a location at your project site that has at least eight to 10 hours of direct sunlight each day to have a more um, diverse variety of options available uh, to choose from. Hey Joe. Um, so hey that's, Joe. yeah. There was a question earlier about the sunlight. Could you specify like what time of year is ideal to have at least eight hours of sunlight? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, of course your location depends on when the growing season is gonna start and end. Um, but the growing season is not gonna include typically the summer months and so it's not like you're gonna need uh, eight to 10 hours every day for the entire year. It's more so the, the growing season. And again, that can depend state by state when that will be. And I'll also get into more detail in just a moment, um, how you can break down not only state by state, but what region and even within your county, how that growing season can start and end depending on um, your temperature and the first and last frost. But the growing season is the time frame that you're looking at to have this ideal amount of sunlight. Uh, there's, of yep. course, oh, yeah. Can I add a question to your raised bed section or did I interrupt you? Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, so Carly ahead. is asking about using tires um, because that's kind of a trendy thing to do for hot crops. And uh, she's saying, is there enough research to know whether this harmful chemical leaches passively from tire raised beds into our salmon run? So super good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Monica, I don't know if you want to take that question on. I personally don't know the... Um the scientific articles behind utilizing tires. I think that permaculture is a great practice. And I think, um, you know, as I'll get into in just a moment, reusing um, materials that would otherwise go to the landfill is something we always vocalize. But if there's any safety concern at all, we always lean away from it. So kind of going um, towards like the materials used 
for raised garden beds. I always tell people to stay away from railroad ties. They have a nasty um, chemical that's called creosote. Uh, and then um, pressure treated wood can really have some nasty chemicals in it as well. So although pressure treated wood breaks down slower, you don't want those chemicals leaching into the soil that um, would be used to grow edible uh, fruits or vegetables. Um, and so in that same regard, because I don't know 100% um, like how much uh, chemical from that tire leaches into the soil, I would lean away from that personally. Um, I think that if you're maybe not near any um, waterways and you're not growing food that's edible in the tire, maybe you're growing pollinator gardens or something like that, I would assume that's much more applicable than if you were near a waterway and you were planning on growing something edible in that um, tire bed. Monica, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, so there is actually a chemical in tires that where they've used them as underwater reefs. This is why this is such a good point. Yeah. Um, and it has been very problematic. Stuff won't grow on it except for in space, invasive marine species. So I'm going to send Ooh. everybody a link to the pluses and minuses of using oh. tires. Perfect. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, one of the things that we keep in mind when we um, try and implement community garden spaces is how close to a major roadway they are, because not only are there some tricky chemicals that you may want to stay away from in tires, but also in brake pads. And so there's some nasty carcinogenic and, and toxic chemicals that come from brake pads and tires deteriorating over time. Uh, with excessive braking. And so when we implement community garden spaces, we ideally want them to have, be a little bit away from a major roadway for that same reason. So I, I really do appreciate that question. It's definitely a valid concern. Um, and just to finish off this slide real quick, the other aspect that you wanna um, consider when implementing a raised garden bed at your location is um, planting north to south it prevents plants from shading each other. So in the same way that you wanna find an ideal site that has a certain amount of sunlight per day in the growing season, you also want to avoid plants from shading each other. Um, you know, growing food on a small scale at your location, this doesn't pertain to you quite as much as if you were going to grow food um, on a large scale farm where it could drastically affect a larger percentage of your crop, but it is something to consider and keep in mind. Um, again, building raised garden beds, we're gonna have some follow-up resources for folks to uh, apply this to their own garden space and have a couple options uh, available. Um, but here's just some quick pictures of various garden bed options that folks have uh, utilized in the community. So upcycling, this goes back to how in sheet mulching, uh, we really try to emphasize folks using uh, cardboard um, from their own home in the sheet mulching process. And the same thing goes for raised garden beds that we distribute throughout Snohomish County. Um, these are from shipping containers that would otherwise go to the landfill. Uh, so it's really serving a dual purpose of reducing landfill waste while also helping local food security efforts. Um, this was this picture was taken from a uh, community garden space that we helped implement in Edmonds, Washington, and the, this garden club uh, adopting this garden space uh, and managing it. Well, they're actually going to utilize this um, area for growing food for the local food bank. Um, well, something that I'll get into in just a moment as well is one of our programs is called the Manure Share Program, where we utilize compost from aged uh, horse manure. And so that way, um, a lot of the different components utilized in this garden space uh, were, um, you know, great local resources that we allocated to this project site. Um, these garden beds uh, that I'm going to get into here, um, they're also great and they're, they're great at saving space as well. You can see how these pallets were utilized um, to grow vertically. Uh, of course, when you're going to grow something like this uh, or in something like this, you want to utilize plants that have more shallow root systems. So things like lettuce or certain herbs. It looks like maybe we have some uh, cilantro or basil. I see maybe um, some dark romaine in there as well. 
So um, just thinking about the uh, area you have to work with and having a um, plant selection that meets that, uh, that need. And uh, pallets are a great thing to utilize that would prevent them from going into the waste stream. Uh, here's another great picture of folks utilizing pallets and connecting um, uh, plastic cups and plastic uh, soda containers to them uh, to utilize for their vertical growing. Um, you know, this is a great way to prevent things from going into the waste stream again, uh, whether it's wood or plastic, just reusing things. Uh, but of course, you know, contemplating whether your substances are going to leach anything out into the soil, uh, like that tire question earlier. Here's another great example using old hay bales. You actually see a uh, drip irrigation system set up in here as well, which we'll also get into in just a moment. Um, but you can tell that all these um, vegetables are very happy. This cabbage looks like it's, it's thriving in there. And that's uh, maybe squash in the background, or I might even see some flowers and, and maybe a sunflower back there. So um, yeah, just being um, kind of imaginative on what you can utilize for your garden bed space um, is great. And there's all kinds of options available that you can uh, choose to work with. So if you don't have a big yard, that's not a problem. We mentioned a couple options for vertical gardening. We do work with a lot of folks in Sonomish County that maybe just have a balcony or an apartment. And uh, we, before COVID-19, uh, we had done many site visits um, to help folks figure out what kinds of um, containers they can utilize based on the, the existing space they have available that will work for them. You do wanna check in with your apartment complex or wherever you live to make sure that uh, if you have any hanging, you know, balcony boxes, anything like that, that it's not uh, that it's abiding by the codes they have in place, and some apartments don't like overhanging um, boxes over the balcony. But as you can see here, there's other ways to go about it with um, different planter boxes there as well. Uh, so if you have any interest in um, uh, requiring um, or what's required to implement growing food on a small scale or in a small area, um, please let us know, and we can provide technical assistance and uh, information on various resources we can help connect you with. I will say um, I have a new puppy as well. And so if you hear any of those sounds in the background, um, just bear in mind she's learning manners and uh, it shouldn't um, be prolonged uh, throughout the presentation. So um, this next slide, soil preparation, getting to know your soil and taking soil samples are definitely very important important aspects of site selection. Uh, when a, a potential farmer is looking at going out to a, a potential um, uh, area they're looking to purchase and they know like what kinds of fruit or produce they're looking to grow, the first thing that they really want to do or one of the first things is take a, uh, an analysis of the soil and what's existing in that soil and what maybe they would need to add to the soil to successfully grow what they're planning. Um, and so that's really important before you make any kind of investment or long-term plans to really know what you're working with in that soil. Of course, one of the components that a soil test will help you figure out is the fertility of that soil. Um, again, a lot of what's required uh, as far as nutrient content goes can change based on the specific plant variety you're looking to grow. Um, but having a, a good synopsis and assessment of what um, you're dealing with will help you move forward um, from there. So some other things that soil tests can help with uh, as far as uh, analyzing what's existing in the soil include uh, pH, uh, salt, organic matter, nutrients, of course, contaminants, and then one of the um, some nutrients that we uh, vocalize folks to look into uh, are NPK or nitrous or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so those three are the main uh, nutrient components that you're wanting to consider uh, when analyzing the soil and figuring out what may grow successfully and what kinds of things to add to that soil. 
Um, again, we will provide other information to the folks and the attendees of this class today on soil testing. Um, some of the soil testing may vary uh, what part of the country or uh, the world that you're tuning in today from. Um, but in general, uh, we have some great resources for folks in the Pacific Northwest specifically. Um, there are conservation districts, however, all across the US. And so if you want to follow up with us um, and require or and uh, receive more insight into what soil testing um, options are available in your region, we can always connect you with another conservation district in another part of the country. Um, so here's a great uh, website for a lab that we've worked with in the past in the Pacific Northwest. And we do have more additional, uh, more comprehensive resources available for folks after the presentation today, along with um, more specific steps that would be required uh, when conducting a soil test. Um, so after the soil test, uh, you'll know what nutrients to add. Again, NPK or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are so the, some of the main ones that you're going to want to um, keep in mind. They're the primary nutrients to, um, to pay attention to. Um, of course, these soil amendments, cover crops, and compost are great ways to add these nutrients. Um, but we do list a couple other specific things in here that can add to the N, P, or K amount uh, in your soil. And then there's other options that we include in our follow-up resources as well. So as I mentioned, compost is full of these three primary nutrients. Um, it contains nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It also increases the soil's ability to both hold and store nutrients over time. Um, I will say, you know, during the, uh, the rainy season, you know, the rain can wash away um, some of the nutrients and leach away some of the nutrients from the compost. So it's always good to replenish compost um, when you can uh, over time or else those nutrients can drain away. But in general, it does a great job of retaining them. Um, so compost is organic matter that increases nutrient and water retention in soil. It reduces the need for fertilizers and pesticides. Um, here we have a, a neat little compost uh, container we built for a community garden space. And again, our composting PowerPoint that you uh, folks will have access to, we'll dive in more detail into some of the other composting um, options available and what those look like. So the five rules for composting that we like to try and abide by and emphasize include, include allowing for oxygen or aeration in the soil, um, balance of nutrients, or in this case, keeping in mind a good balanced ratio of carbon and nitrogen, um, watching the temperature, um, managing moisture, and covering the pile. So, in the Pacific Northwest, we, we do have a lot of moisture um, throughout the year. And so uh, some of these rules of thumb may change based on your climate and environment. Um, you know, if you're living in a, a state that's much hotter and drier than we are, the, uh, the frequency of turning the pile and keeping an eye on it may uh, adjust slightly depending on your, your project site. Um, but in general, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, to aerate, you want to turn every five to 10 days. You can also add um, what's called a ventilation stack coming out of the pile. Typically, that's um, uh, PVC piping that you would have coming out of the lower end or middle of the pile to allow airflow in there as well. Or you can also turn um, elevated compost bins um, to increase airflow. And in general, Cured compost can take, um, you know, between six to 12 months, but that of course depends on your location and how moist or dry your climate is. So again, that balance of nutrients or in this case, balance of or ratio of carbon and nitrogen, it can be quite difficult to calculate. Um, we do provide some carbon and nitrogen ratio tables in our follow-up resources. Um, but in general, juicy uh, materials higher in nitrogen, drier, older, woody materials higher in carbon. 
And so if this ratio becomes off a little bit um, and too much carbon occurs, you can have a slower decomposition, too much nitrogen or a wetter pile, um, you're gonna have a smellier and messier pile and, and no one really wants that. So a good rule of thumb for finding a good ratio or balance in your pile includes uh, having a bucket of green material, two buckets of brown material uh, combined with air and water really creates one heck of a good compost pile. So that's a great simple way to go about it. Um, again, the temperature is a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, having a three foot thermometer gets right into the middle of that compost pile uh, where it's nice and hot. And it'll also help you kind of understand when you would wanna really start keeping an eye on turning that pile. Um, you know, a rule of thumb in this region is around 130 degrees, but it really depends on where you're located and the moisture in the air and things of that nature. But uh, just keeping in mind, hot is good in this instance. And so um, when it becomes hotter, you know the decomposition process is progressing and the compost pile is doing its job. So the final steps of a great compost include uh, managing um, uh, the moisture and covering the pile. And so again, just to reiterate, too much water results in a bad smell, not enough water results in slow decomposition. And so a good way to um, kind of manage that is utilizing a tarp to cover that pile when needed and keeping an eye on that moisture content. Uh, here's a great rule of thumb, as you can see on the screen. If you squeeze a handful of material into your fist um, and if it drips, it's too wet. If it falls apart and grumbly, it's too dry. Uh, so a small amount of film of water on your palm is just right. Here's some great things to keep in mind when um, in utilizing compost at your location. Uh, what not to include, include these items here. Uh, most of these are self-explanatory, you know, pet waste, you don't want that um, to be in compost that you would use around your food for obvious reasons as far as, you know, bacteria and things go. Um, but then a lot of these also pertain to uh, reducing the amount of pests that may accumulate around your compost. So greasy and oily foods, dairy, meat and seafood, um, not only do these bring um, additional bacteria you want to avoid, but they really increase the amount of pests um, that you would see at your site. Egg shells are actually fine if you rinse out the egg shell, they do add some calcium. Um, but you want to make sure that there's no uh, remaining egg residue within the shell. And then wood ash is fine, but charcoal ash, as you can imagine, is going to have some uh, chemicals that are not ideal for human consumption. And so if you're using charcoal ash in your compost, um, you definitely want to stay away from that, especially if you're going to be growing food utilizing that compost. Again, um, things that you want to avoid include plants with pesticides in the compost or diseased plants. <clears throat> um, both of these things can really have a, a prolonged um, half-life or a breakdown period much longer than uh, the amount of time needed for uh, the compost to decompose and be ready for application at, in your garden space. And so even though the compost looks ready to go, there could be some of these remaining um, diseases or pesticides in your um, pile if you didn't abide by this rule. So it's really great to keep that in mind. Hey, Joe. Yeah. We have a question I've never heard before. Are there oh, any sure. non-pesticide ways to deal with slugs and slug eggs and compost? I don't want to add a lot of those to my vegetable bed. Agreed. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I, I haven't come up with that, uh, I haven't, had that question in the past, but I would say there's an organic soil amendment called diatomaceous earth that kills slug eggs. And so it's not gonna get rid of the slug itself, but it's not gonna uh, um, allow them to uh, procreate in that way. Uh, same with a lot of um, beetle eggs where certain beetles can be pests in the garden. Some are great, but some are not. Um, and so that might be a good option. Um, I honestly know more about mitigating slugs once you're dealing with your garden space and not so much in the compost. Um, I would also think that slugs would be more likely to make a home in your compost if you had excess 
um, water in there. So when I think of, you know, when it comes to be winter time in the Pacific Northwest and a lot of these plants start to fall over and their leaves start to deteriorate um, and they're, they're excessively wet, it can kind of be like a slug hotel and you see all these different slugs and things um, uh, gathering around those plants that are breaking down. Um, that's from excess moisture, similar to how you'd see in a compost pile if, if there was too much moisture. And so I would say just keeping an eye on the uh, amount of wetness in your pile is good. Um, also, something that we'll get into in more detail in our other, um, in our other PowerPoint involving composting primarily is thinking about your, your project site and what you're dealing with there. And so there's a lot of compost bin options that are more secure from the outside uh, environment. And that can be for various reasons, whether you have a dog in the yard, you don't want to get into it or, um, or rodents that you don't want to get into your compost. Those um, more protected compost bins can also uh, inhibit slugs from getting in there as well. Um, and so that can be an option is to look into that PowerPoint a little more and see some of those options that are more secured from the outside environment inhibiting slugs and other pests from, from getting into there. Okay, a um, couple short questions on composting before we move on. Why is sure. a little egg white on the shell an issue? And what about using coffee grounds? Sure. Um, so I would say used coffee grounds are great. They're actually included in our list of, um, of uh, added soil amendments that can increase um, uh, nitrogen or carbon. And so those are just fine. Um, I would say that for egg whites, again, it goes back to, um, to this area. So you want to avoid uh, garden pests when possible. And you can imagine like a rodent is going to have much more of an issue or much more of an interest, I should say, with um, consuming egg whites than they are the egg shells. Uh, so to my knowledge, the primary reason for that is reducing uh, rodents and pests from, from gathering. Um, if you really have a secured compost uh, setup and it's um, it reaches a certain heated temperature. I would assume that that would be okay, but that's not typically what you find in a backyard compost setting. And so just keeping in mind what most folks have to work with, um, their pile isn't going to hit a certain heat where you wouldn't have to worry about either the bacteria accumulating from, uh, from raw eggs or you wouldn't have to worry about um, pests getting in there. So you know, to give you an example really quick, we work with um, different dairy farms in Snohomish County. They actually have something called an anaerobic digester. This is something that is a way to compost um, not only cow waste, but cow parts themselves from, um, you know, butcher yards and things. And so all these different cow um, body parts and waste go into this giant vat. It's a, you know, a, a very expensive setup. And what happens is it, it's heated to a certain temperature where the methane um, actually goes to power the farm um, that's gathered from the top of this setup. And then the, uh, the heat is hot enough to kill any bacteria or nasty substances that might um, be found in the pet waste, or sorry, the cow waste or the cow parts. Uh, and then that's actually piped out onto the farm fields as liquid fertilizer. And then the remaining amount is an inert substance called spent dairy fiber. And that's actually used in a lot of potting soil um, in, for farms across the region. So it's a really neat um, setup and it's a, a lot different of a, a way to compost than a, a backyard gardener might have in part because it heats at a much higher temperature um, and it's also a much more scientific uh, way to go about it. Very um, controlled environment, I should say. And so for what folks have to work with in their backyard, it really keeps it much simpler and uh, safer when you just abide by these, these rules. Does that kind of help a little bit, Monica? Oh, Sorry, okay. yes, I was on mute. Okay. Keep sure. going. <laughs> perfect, perfect. 
Um, so moving right along here, I just wanted to touch on a few other things that you have your pile. Um, black walnut is one. It has something called juglone. I think I'm, I may be saying that accurately. Uh, it inhibits plant growth. And so again, if there's any remaining juglone in the black walnut breaking down in your compost pile, if you re reapplied that to things you're trying to grow, it would actually have a detrimental effect. Same goes for a plant called laurel. Uh, laurel out here has a form of cyanide that's toxic to plants and humans. Um, so if you ever had any laurel going into your compost pile, not only could you um, be uh, sick from it, but it would also harm the plants that you're applying it to. So, so those are two things to keep in mind. And I'm sure there's other things that um, would you'd wanna keep in mind similar to those, depending on what part of the country uh, you're coming from. Uh, also, of course, avoiding perennial weeds and seeds um, in your compost uh, to keep those roots from spreading. Uh, these, of course, can be uh, even more so important when you're dealing with blackberry, ivy, or morning glory in the Pacific Northwest. You even have a small piece of a root system of any of those, and they can very easily um, survive the time frame of the breakdown process in the compost. In, and then once you reapply that to the garden, uh, it's very easy for those to uh, reestablish themselves. And so um, that also goes into the variable of, of the temperature. The hotter the temperature of your compost pile, the more likely it is that these seeds and root systems are going to break down if they, uh, by chance, find a way to get into your pile. So the Snohomish Conservation District has a great program called the Manure Share Program. Um, we connect, uh, you know, landscapers, uh, home gardeners, community gardens with uh, farms in their area that have a, an excess of aged uh, horse manure primarily, which can be used uh, as compost for amending soil. Um, so this is a great way to save on, um, on compost, buying it from the store. Um, and uh, one thing to keep in mind if you did want to get on our list of folks interested in this resource, um, is that it is quite acidic. And so sometimes adding a little bit of lime um, to this is a great way to kind of neutralize that acidity. Um, but again, it has some really great um, nutrients in it, including the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, there's also a link here if you wanted to uh, receive more information about this program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a whole entire separate composting PowerPoint that attendees today can have access to in a follow-up email, um, and we go in more depth, in, in more depth uh, into the different composting options available um, in that presentation. Uh, here's also a link to our website with more information about um, home composting practices as well. So of course there's many benefits to composting, including nutrient and water retention and reducing stormwater runoff. Here is a link uh, with more information uh, with one of our community um, uh, collaborators, uh, WSU Extension, uh, where they provide more insight into that as well. Uh, but again, to reiterate, it really helps manage um, the water uh, retention and reducing stormwater runoff into your yard, which is a great segue into our next topic, um, which is water systems. And so, as you can imagine, um, connecting rain barrels, totes, uh, cisterns, and drip irrigation for folks, uh, for community garden spaces into the gardens that we install um, is a great way to uh, make water use more efficient. And so this is a great way to, uh, a great practice to slow the, storm, the storm surge um, using rainwater catchment systems. Um, there's different options, like I mentioned, uh, hand watering is of course one of them, um, but there's a, a great way to make it more efficient, which is drip irrigation um, shown here, and we'll get in more, uh, more in detail into that. So we do work with people installing rain barrels, totes, cisterns, and connecting them to irrigation for gardens. Um, they will again be available for purchase from the conservation district once the COVID-19 uh, public health concerns and restrictions are reduced, but you can definitely um, look into our program uh, on this link here on the screen 
and you can send us an email if you'd like to be added to our wait list of folks interested in, in purchasing uh, these items. So uh, considering what is more relevant to your project site is uh, good to keep in mind. Um, here's the large catchment volume for a large garden. Uh, posts and cisterns are well suited for farms and rain barrels are typically um, work better for individual homeowners. Uh, although you can see here uh, in the background, there's two large totes stacked up uh, on top of oh, one wow. another. Yeah, to feed <laughs> um, this large garden space. So. Um, yeah, that's a great setup for the site they have on hand. Um, <clears throat> here is a small volume for a smaller garden. Uh, drip irrigation for these rain barrels, uh, just using gravity alone, uh, requires rain barrels to be at least two feet above the ground. Um, also, you want to keep in mind that uh, the uh, garden beds shouldn't typically be more than like 10 to 12 feet away from the uh, rain barrels with drip irrigation if you're only using gravity. Um, if you're any farther away than that, you may want to consider installing a pump to get the water where it needs to go. Um, of course, these totes, uh, rain barrels, and cisterns can be quite heavy. And so um, it, during the installation process, it's really important to have uh, cement blocks or something that's very sturdy um, to make sure that they're as level as possible to avoid tipping. Uh, folks often will include some sort of cage like this to keep them uh, contained, or as you can see, there's a metal cage around the totes and we'll often um, attach those to the side of a building as they can be quite heavy once they're full. Um, typically, when, just to give folks an example, uh, when the Pacific Northwest has a rainfall of around an inch or two, Keeping in mind, if you have an average size roof, um, you can fill easily probably uh, nine or 10 of these 55 gallon rain barrels in one uh, sitting if you have a one or two inch rainfall on an average size roof. So they, they fill up quite quickly. And um, unfortunately, collecting stormwater in this way is not uh, legal across the US. It does depend state by state. And so you just wanna look into that, um, maybe reaching out to your local conservation district can help give you an idea of, of um, what's required to implement that at your project site. Um, whether it is storm water collected from your roof or water coming out of the tap, uh, utilizing drip irrigation is much more efficient uh, than just a regular hose. So drip irrigation or what you call a soaker hose is a great way to get the water to um, go directly to the root systems of the plants, since up to half of surface water can be lost to evaporation. Um, this is uh, something that, again, can vary state by state, but in general, especially in the Pacific Northwest, uh, that is um, up to half of all surface water can be lost to evaporation. So it's uh, definitely a much more efficient method. Moving right along, uh, we're going to get into uh, what plants work well in your environment and what kinds of variables to consider uh, when choosing your, um, your plant selection for your project site. So one thing to consider is um, planting zones for your site selection and options um, to fit your location. So planting zones are, um, I mentioned briefly earlier, they're something that considers uh, the approximate temperature during the certain time of year based on where you're located. Um, I will say in just Snohomish County alone, we have around eight different planting zones. And so this USDA website um, will be included in our resource page um, through the follow-up email and at the end of the PowerPoint. Uh, but it's a really great way to look into what planting zone you fall under, which will give you a better idea on when you can start planting certain um, vegetable and fruit varieties throughout the year. Um, so this determines basically which plants grow well um, in your environment based on temperature. Uh, of course, regional differences in planting zones uh, also include urban environments with pavement. You can imagine that those areas would um, heat up quicker. Uh, and then some local differences, of course, it can depend project site to project site, uh, include, you know, the amount of sun and shade that you have, the moisture in the soil, uh, the soil composition. 
which can uh, change quite drastically location to location. Um, thinking about how to adapt to extend your growing season and thinking about uh, crop selection for your site. Um, just considering the Pacific Northwest, uh, up north, the farther you go, the more some uh, fall crop varieties would work well due to being colder. Uh, these adjustments can alter what can be grown effectively. So you see here, uh, they were implementing sheet mulching here and uh, off to the left, they're growing some native perennials in there. Um, <clears throat> this greenhouse is great for uh, germinating seeds that eventually become starts and ready uh, to transplant elsewhere. Um, right now, uh, the Western Washington area is uh, experiencing a little bit of colder weather. Um, of course, not so much if you're tuning in from places like uh, Duluth or uh, different colder states, but um, in general, uh, plants that you want to plant in the summer months um, around this time that you want to start to grow indoors, you know, let's say tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, something like that. Uh, you'll want to, of course, start those in a um, in a greenhouse like this uh, one here, and then transplant later on in the summertime once uh, temperatures become warmer. Otherwise, of course, those vegetables will not survive uh, started outside. Um, and then off to the right, you can see a raised garden bed and it has a hoop house installed on top. Um, this is just simple PVC pipe that's bendable. Um, that can, creates kind of a rib cage going on top of the raised garden bed. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you cover it with um, somewhat translucent uh, plastic to keep in water, uh, uh, moisture and, um, and heat. And this gentleman uh, that went on a site visit somewhat recently, he actually had a heating element under um, the soil down below as well. So he was really adapting to his colder, um, his colder uh, project site to make sure that the plants he wanted to grow uh, would survive well. Uh, so these adjustments can really be um, utilized to adapt uh, what can be grown effectively at your project site. Um, I will say a lot of these crops can be grown today, uh, depending on where you're located. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest, some of these varieties may need to be started a little later in the season. Um, but you can always reach out to us or other conservation districts in your region and get more insight into um, planting plans and what time frame would be good to start some of these varieties. Again, just to reiterate, um, vegetable varieties, they require different levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, or NP and K, as well as different levels of sunlight and moisture. I mentioned earlier on, that leafy greens and root vegetables don't require quite as much sunlight. So as you can see here, looks like maybe some kale. And I think off to the right out of the picture, they had some Swiss chard, which don't require quite as much sun. Um, of course, the sustainability aspect of this presentation um, kind of emphasizes how can you uh, be more efficient with your resources and uh, for um, keeping in mind uh, environmentally friendly practices. And so reusing materials is great to embody those. And one of the ways to do that is reusing old vegetable scraps. And so um, propagating the base of a green onion, um, uh, its root systems and water for a couple days can actually allow you to eventually reuse that and grow it. Uh, so you want to make sure and change the water daily um, which is a great way to reuse that plant base. And this can be done not just for green onions, but uh, for certain other onion varieties, for garlics, for uh, sometimes romaine lettuce, um, for uh, um, a couple other varieties. And basically you just wanna make sure that the root systems are not completely cut off at the time of uh, purchase and then that way you can reuse that base of the plant stock and, and utilize it again um, later on. And so after the roots grow a little longer, uh, you can transplant them in a pot with soil on the windowsill or directly outside. Um, typically when folks want to uh, try this out on their own, transplanting them outside in the Pacific Northwest, usually um, for some most of these varieties I mentioned, um, like celery or romaine lettuce, uh, you want to wait until around Mother's Day. But again, that can change depending on uh, where you're tuning in from across the US or, or the world. Um, 
Again, a similar practice is uh, utilizing older potatoes that you may not want to consume. Um, if your potatoes turn green and, and get what they call eyes, uh, you can plant them in a barrel and grow potatoes instead of throwing them out. Uh, here's a link down below on, with more information on how to utilize that practice. I've also um, seen in the past too, that if these potatoes grow eyes, you can actually cut off different sections of the potato that have those growing green eyes. And each of those sections will become a new potato if done successfully. So it's a great way to um, circulate that back in and uh, consume it later on. Um, I do know that, that you don't wanna be consuming these uh, green eyes coming out of the potato. Uh, they're not good um, for your health, but they will become a new potato and edible in the future. Um, along those lines, uh, germinating seeds with soil in uh, used egg cartons, uh, reusing those cartons is a great way to um, keep those in a, a closed loop system in your household and um, putting them on a windowsill is a great activity for all ages. Uh, this typically would be utilized for um, plants like or uh, vegetable varieties like uh, peas or beans work pretty well for this. Um, and just keeping in mind that uh, you wanna keep them moist on that windowsill, maybe spritzing them every now and then. Uh, you can also start uh, seeds to germinate uh, between wet paper towels in a plastic bag as well. Uh, but this is a fun kind of tangible way for folks to engage with maybe younger audiences and teach them about uh, the starting, initial growing process of uh, vegetable varieties. Uh, moving along, we are going into uh, cover crops and garden winterization. Uh, we see here uh, fava beans up top used as a cover crop and then uh, white clover down below. Um, the legume family peas and beans typically are great at adding nitrogen to the soil uh, during the growing off season. These aren't typically used to consume, uh, but more so to replenish uh, nutrients into the soil. I mentioned at the very beginning of the PowerPoint how the conservation districts had started after the Dust Bowl. And one of the um, contributing factors of why that Dust Bowl had been initiated was because of things like uh, over tilling, but also uh, monocropping or growing the same crop over and over in the soil and depleting the nutrients. And then that topsoil eventually um, is so, uh, it, it's lacking so many nutrients that it eventually blows away in the wind and creates these dust storms. And so just trying to learn from the past, how can we alter our growing practices to um, create a healthier environment and, and reduce um, previous mistakes. And that's one way to go about it is uh, cover crops, uh, as well as um, what I'll get into in just a moment of companion planting and uh, crop rotation. So companion planting uh, involves how there's a symbiotic relationship with certain plants. This is a great example on the screen here of companion planting that would work well, specifically in the uh, specific North or Pacific Northwest, um, but it could pertain to other areas of the country. Um, so some plants add certain nutrients to the soil and other plants take those nutrients away. And so if you figure out how to grow certain things near each other, um, they can work together to reduce those nutrients from being depleted. Um, companion planting also involves utilizing plants like uh, marigolds that will um, uh, allow uh, certain things to be emitted in the air, scents that deter pests and bugs, um, and uh, then geraniums and other flowers, sunflowers, uh, they bring in um, different pollinators, which actually increase uh, yield um, when there's more pollinators available. And that's also something we'll get into in our March 6th um, class uh, about integrated pest management. Here's another example, a classic, um, more famous example of companion planting called the Three Sisters. Uh, you can see there's a link at the bottom of the screen for more information about other companion planting options. Um, but this bean, corn, and squash variety works really well together. Um, it's been uh, really well documented throughout history that this has worked in a symbiotic way. Um, the corn stalks are used as a lattice um, for the beans and the squash. They also provide shade to block out um, other weeds from uh, taking over 
Um, and it's just the beans add nitrogen, nitrogen to the soil. So they really work well together. And this is just one great example of many of um, good companion, companion planting options. Um, along those lines, crop rotation also um, kind of keeps in mind what plants take certain nutrients out of the soil and what um, other ones uh, replenish in the soil. Um, crop rotation is also very important for uh, avoiding bacterial and fungal plant diseases. Um, one example that I've come across uh, somewhat recently is something called club root, which uh, occurs when the brassica family or um, you know, broccoli is a, a famous member of the brassica family. When you plant those over and over in the sa same space too often, uh, it can create club root. And this actually is a nuisance because it will reside in the soil for up to 10 years and you can't get rid of it um, unless you avoid planting a brassica for up to 10 years in that same soil. So it's really important to consider uh, crop rotation in your planting plan. Um, another example on the screen here is how tomatoes require a fair amount of N, P, and K or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, so they would really benefit from uh, crop rotation with cover crops in the growing off season for things like beans, um, which add nitrogen into the soil. And then uh, accompanied after that by growing a crop like an onion, which doesn't require too much of that. So thinking about these different steps can really add to overall soil health and increase productivity and, um, and efficiency and overall yield. So I just wanted to say again, uh, please reach out to the Snohomish Conservation District or other conservation districts in your area if you would like assistance with creating a planting plan that takes these kinds of things uh, into account. Uh, you can probably recall not too long ago, we had a before picture of a project site with a bare yard. And here is the after picture uh, utilizing some of these raised garden beds um, that we covered. Uh, the, I don't think these are tires. I'm pretty sure they're a, um, a fabric uh, raised bed option that folks have um, utilized more often in, in the recent uh, past. They're becoming more and more um, popular. And then of course, just uh, planter boxes around here. Um, so it's a great way to show how someone had really changed dramatically their existing lawn space into a, a really aesthetically pleasing way to grow um, vegetables above ground on their project site. So moving along, uh, now that we have your garden set up and planted, uh, you'll have to keep the weeds down, water, and control pests. Uh, my personal favorite part, and often folks think the best part comes at harvest, when you can glean food for yourself and for others. Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic occurring, we did lead a lot of gleaning events in Snohomish County where we had food banks um, come park their large uh, distribution vehicles and we had large groups of volunteers come um, and help harvest uh, fruit or produce for local food security efforts. Uh, volunteers could take home some of what they harvested at the end of the day and the majority went to uh, local food banks. And so this is a sweet corn harvest that we had um, on EB Island uh, just outside of Lake Stevens and Everett in Snohomish County. This uh, raised around uh, a couple, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds actually of uh, sweet corn for various food banks in the area. And I think in 2019, we raised almost 70,000 pounds of fruit and produce uh, for food banks in Snohomish County. So um, in 2020, of course, with the pandemic, we weren't able to lead these events, but we still uh, were doing our best to connect local food banks with farms that had excess fruit or produce uh, to make sure that it, it goes to a good home. Hey, Joe. Yeah. I just want to be mindful of the time, and this is all important information that you're giving, but um, we sure. only have about eight minutes left in the class. And oh, so sure. I want to just make sure we have enough time for questions at the end. Yeah, so that sounds great. Touch on a couple more things really fast, but then we'll uh, open it up for questions. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. We're just, we have a couple left, and I'll just breeze right along here. Okay. Um, and so, again, we're going to have a integrated pest management. Um, uh, uh, PowerPoint in the near future. So we'll go into more detail about why um, pollinators and different uh, insects are beneficial for your garden space. Uh, but just to reiterate, uh, they do help increase the yield of fruit and vegetable production. 
Uh, letting nature help is really important. And so having a, a healthy habitat for birds and even snakes and dragonflies and things can really help um, encourage, uh, and encouraging this kind of wildlife is important. They can help uh, remove things, garden pests like um, rodents and um, insects that you don't want in your garden space. And so what we would like to reiterate uh, is harvesting uh, what you can use and then donating what you don't use to a local food security program and food bank would be ideal. Uh, on our website, um, we do have a, a, a page for um, all the different participating food banks in Snohomish County where you can donate fruit or produce you grow from your own home. We do allow uh, folks to receive free vegetable seeds from us. Um, we're putting that on pause until the COVID-19 public health concerns are reduced, but we do have a wait list of folks. So feel free to reach out to us if you'd like to be involved in our plant to row program and receive free vegetable seeds, um, as long as you can donate one row of what you grow to food banks in Snohomish County. And um, that we even have a video on our website of the different steps on how to not only grow, but um, from start to finish, how to donate that uh, produce uh, that you grew at home to a local food security program. So I just want to thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your day all across the country and even the world to tune in today. And it's, um, you know, in this time, it's more important than ever to um, not only be more self-sufficient with what you're growing, uh, but to also benefit um, your local community who may be facing a lot of food insecurity issues and just trying to work together um, to better the community, better your local environment and become more self-sufficient is a really great um, takeaway for today's presentation. So thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. And we, of course, will follow up with folks on additional resources um, uh, through email. And then we also have these two slides at the very end of the PowerPoint as well um, with additional resources. So I'd love to open up for any questions um, from folks and hey. uh, we can go from there. Hey, Joe, um, we had uh, questions about what type of hay to use if you're going to do hay bale gardens and then what plants to grow in them. Oh, OK. Um, you know, I personally don't have a lot of experience with utilizing hay for a garden bed. I'm not sure um, if there's a bad uh, variety out there uh, for that. I guess maybe we can take down your contact information and we can follow up with you since a lot of the time when I go out to a site visit and I give folks my technical expertise, if I don't have an immediate answer, I have I work with a lot of folks who may have more knowledge on certain subjects than myself. So I'd be happy to follow up with you in more detail on what would be the ideal kind of hay uh, bale to utilize. As far as and, the um, okay. people are pitching in some information, I can tell you the one thing like I had used alfalfa and you would not want to plant in it. It's, um, it's not going to have weed seeds, but it's super high nitrogen. So people do mix it in their soil to have it break down. Um, and then uh, people talked about using straw rather than hay. Straw can still have seeds in it. So do know that it just isn't the degree, depending on when the hay was harvested, because like grass hay, if you harvest it before it seeds out, which is customary, mm -hmm. um, then you wouldn't necessarily have seeds or you would just have stuff that generally blows in. So um, yeah. we can definitely, uh, we can definitely send you some links on on that afterward. And then there's a question we can, uh, the URL to sign up for compost from local farmers. So your conservation, are you the only conservation district um, that does the manure share? You know, that's a good question. I'm, we're the only conservation district that I know of that does a manure share program, but there's over 80 conservation districts across the country. And so odds are one of them probably does something similar to that. Um, so I can't say for certain. Uh, I would definitely recommend reaching out to the local one you have and um, go from there. I think, I think odds are in your favor that there's gotta be one other one out there that does something similar. Um, but feel free to let us know uh, via email to the email on the screen. Um, here if you want to be um, utilizing that resource in Snohomish County. Okay, and then um, 
uh, what else did we have? Do you have a good, like, generic materials site, like safe materials to use in gardens? Because we were going back and forth in the chat, like wood pallets can be heat treated or they can be uh, chemical treated, which is bad. Is there a single one-stop shopping for safe garden materials? I was not finding anything. Hmm. You know, I don't know. I would say that uh, using evergreen or coniferous wood is best because it breaks down slower. But as far as the safety uh, aspect goes, I've heard both sides of it. I've heard that um, pressure treated wood that was uh, pressure treated before a certain year uses less metals in that process. But, you know, just playing it safe with, with food safety and garden safety, I just lean away from it entirely uh, as far as pressure treated wood goes. Uh, if there's any question of having um, any of that material leach into your soil. Um, so it's just a sacrifice that I'm willing to make of having the garden um, bed break down sooner and not have those nasty chemicals in there. Um, I would say if you're in the Seattle area, a good resource for that would be the Tilt Alliance uh, organization. I think they have a lot of um, information about raised garden bed um, uh, safety. Uh, I would also look at um, the USDA. If you wanna uh, message me directly, I can send you some of the information I have at hand on, um, on like school garden safety. Um, the USDA has some great resources for school gardens and as you can imagine, they would really prioritize all kinds of aspects of safety involving uh, garden implementation for schools because there's so many different um, variables as far as liability goes for students. And so they really prioritize things that maybe even home garden gardeners wouldn't think of um, when it pertains to schools and, and children's safety in consuming that food. Um, so I'd be happy to follow up with folks on more resources about that that I have at, at my disposal. But as far as a particular website, um, I don't know off the top of my head, I, although I do have access to documents I can follow up with folks. That's fine. If you've got links, Kristen always sends up a follow up email with uh, the link to the presentation with the slides and a link to the recording so she can send them out. Yep. Uh, okay. We have tips on where to go regarding growing edible mushrooms outdoors. Hmm. That's uh, like, so what kind of, um, what kind of environment you would want for growing them or like the specific varieties? Can you elaborate on the question? I think they're looking for uh, like, do you have a resource for, is there a mushroom growing? master gardeners or is there a group that does this locally yeah yeah there's um there is a group uh i think it's called um like ps alms um i don't know what it stands for but it's a mushroom group um that i think is national and i can send that in the info uh that Kristen follows up with folks on um i will say that there's a practice called Kugel culture, um, which utilizes uh, wood breaking down, adding nutrients into the soil, uh, and they utilize, let's say, log, upright log rounds as the sides of the raised garden bed. And so folks will actually inject um, mycelium spores of different mushroom varieties into this decomposing log used as the side of your raised garden bed. And I've seen some really neat looking examples of, uh, of raised beds where there's vegetables growing in the center and then the outside there's um, you know chanterelles and various um, edible mushroom varieties growing outside of the log uh, that's the border of the raised bed so that, and I did um, put practice. a link to uh, Hugo Culture in the chat for everybody, and we'll oh, perfect. again, Kristen can send it out. So we have a uh, a question about someone who did remove a large lot, uh, large lawn, with a sol sod cutter. Boy, I'm doing well this morning. More coffee. Um, so she's got the rolled sod sitting in plastic in her driveway and covered with clear three mil plastic. 
um, how many months might that take to turn into good soil? I wasn't sure if that would actually work to compost it down to soil or if there's something else she needs to do with those sod rolls to turn them into soil and not hmm. have the grass grow once they get a little bit of sunlight. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I would say that, you know, heat is your friend in that case and also uh, making sure that it, it's as cut up as possible. So it sounds to me like this at this time, that might not be ideal. You may want to have it be chopped up um, and then in a, a compost pile for a long period of time where you can actually monitor the temperature with that three foot thermometer we talked about and having it reach to a certain amount of degrees. So typically once a pile reaches around like 130 degrees, um, that's an ideal temperature to kill off some of those, um, those uh, you know, grass seeds and things that may re reseed themselves later on. Um, I would also suggest just um, having maybe a little bit of an experiment with this. And so what you can do is utilize uh, the compost from that material um, in a small space in your garden. And if you don't see any reseeding, then go from there. But I'd hate to give uh, any feedback to you that would end up reseeding your entire garden space with grass. Um, so yeah, again, heat, heat it up as much as possible in your garden bed. And in our resource link we included on one of those composting pages, there's a great page for the WSU extension um, resource online, uh, a website where it talks about hot composting. And so having that balanced ratio of carbon and nitrogen means that you're going to want to keep in mind um, that recipe we talked about of uh, the green versus browns in the compost pile. And it sounds like based on what is just existing there at this time, it would just be the green side of things in that pile. And so you want to make sure and you add more brown to that to allow it to aerate and have more of a, a ratio of the carbon and nitrogen. Uh, and just keep in mind the hotter temperature, the better for those um, grass uh, seeds to break down, but also um, aerating it. So chopping it up as much as possible um, would also be ideal. And I think just a good rule of thumb in that kind of experimental setting, don't apply all of that to a, a garden bed at once, kind of a, a use a little bit and see what happens and go from there. Uh, does the SCD have a source for metal culvert raised beds? Um, are you, I, I imagine that maybe you're talking about like what often looks like a horse trough. Um, those are common to be used for raised beds. As far as like what we implement in the community, we primarily use those shipping containers um, for folks. Um, so I can get back to, to folks on, on an individual level if they wanted some resources on where to acquire metal raised beds. I know of a couple different um, options. I, I can say that I'm not allowed to vocalize specific companies um, because as a working for a special interest district, I can't give preference to any individual organization that um, provides a for-profit resource. So what I can do for you is send a follow-up email with multiple locations of where to find metal raised garden beds and, and we can definitely connect that to you. Okay, yeah, and I know Home Depot sells those uh, horse troughs. They are trendy now. I use my old ones. What I will tell you is that uh, the surface does wear off. So think about it in terms of food gardening. Um, I mostly use mm -hmm. them for raised ornamentals. So. Uh, are there any home use soil tests you can recommend? Um, yeah, the the slide that I had a link, I think it was called AL Labs. Um, that is a, a test, uh, a company out of, I wanna say somewhere near Portland in, in Oregon. Um, and you can reach out to them. I don't recall the exact cost um, for folks um, for that. Unfortunately, uh, Snohomish County just offers free soil testing for commercial farmers. If you're in King County, uh, the King Conservation District actually does, um, to my knowledge, still provide free uh, soil tests for individual homeowners. And so you lucked out if you're in that county, um, they have funding for that. Um, but I can send uh, in a resource 
to Kristen, where she'll follow up with all you folks. Um, I can include many locations across the US uh, that can help with soil testing. So not just folks um, that reside in the Pacific Northwest, but um, soil testing companies all across uh, the nation that you can reach out to. Um, we have a lot of comprehensive um, lists of resources for folks in that regard. One last question. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know, Joe, does um, Kitsap County have a conservation district? So somebody lives on they, Bainbridge Island? I, I sent the oh. link out. My question is, do you know if they do consultations? I know the conservation districts formed a sort of collective to help each other. Um, mm -hmm. But do you know if Kitsap does consultations or if Snohomish does consultations outside of Snohomish? Um, typically, Snohomish doesn't do it outside of Snohomish. Um, but, uh, and you know, I can't really speak for, for other conservation districts without knowing them intimately about what they have funding for. I know that Kinsap is a smaller uh, district and so it's less likely that they can provide in-person site visits. Um, but I can definitely, in a resource uh, list to Kristen, I can include um, contacts for Kitsap on who to reach out to there. Um, I think typically, if the funding is available, conservation districts will make sure uh, that it's a priority to have that technical assistance and on-site um, site visits available to the public. You know, uh, we are, are funded partially by grants, partially by taxpayer dollars. And so we really make it a priority to reach out to the community that we serve. And, um, and so it really just depends district to district how much funding they have at their disposal. And of course, with COVID, uh, restricting a lot of funding sources that typically we take for granted, it may have reduced their capacity to do that. So I can definitely provide uh, contacts for Kitsap um, to Kristen. And I do see on their website that they have backyard habitat assistance, ag assistance, rain gardens, and low impact development. So there are grants and it looks like there's technical information. So um, I put that link in the chat for people um, and then if you can get contacts, that would be great, Joe. Yeah, right. yeah, that sounds perfect. And just to um, let folks know, the conglomeration of multiple uh, conservation districts in this region is called uh, Better Ground. And so if you wanted to look into that, we, uh, there's a website called betterground.org, uh, to my knowledge. And it's a great um, kind of combination of many conservation district uh, efforts coming together. And so we do partner on on all kinds of things um, uh, throughout the year, typically with uh, a combination of other districts. Okay, great. Well, um, we should probably end here since it's um, 1140. So thank you to all of you for being here and for being so engaged. And um, hopefully you gleaned a lot of information. Um, Joe and Monica, thank you for all of your input and um, knowledge that you pass on to us and um, get ready for a lot of resources that I will be emailing everybody um, and probably won't happen until Monday, I'll be honest. So um, yeah, thank you to everyone and um, feel free to join us for our next class on landscaping for wildlife on February 20th. And have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.